discussion on such a very beautiful Saturday afternoon. I'm Andrea Hickey, I'm the senior curator here at MOCA Cleveland, and um, I'm very happy that we are able to uh, come together today to share in a conversation in a few days before our national election. I want to take an opportunity at the start of our event to thank my colleagues, Curator of Public Programs, Deidre McPherson, Assistant Curator Will Brown, who is somewhere out here, um, and all my colleagues at MOCA for collaborating with me on this event, and of course to our director, Jill Snyder, for her visionary support of this initiative. Our sincere thanks also go out to Deborah and Ronald Radner for their support of this program. Uh, so the impetus So the impetus for this meeting is inspired by the idea that all art is political, which is something at the core of Hank Willis Thomas and his collaborators Eric Gotsman and Wyatt Gallery and their Four Freedoms nonpartisan artist super PAC. We've been working with Four Freedoms to spark a local dialogue around this election period through yard sign activities, which you can participate in here at the museum today, voter registration events, and most recently, an installation of a Four Freedoms banner at the fence of the Reading Garden at the Cleveland Public Library, which I think was just installed this Thursday. So if you have a chance to go down to the library, check it out. It's a very powerful image. There's some information here on the screen in the left in the back, so you can see it uh, here at the museum as well. So what does it mean to say that all art is political, especially today in the context, context of this particular political moment? Art and art making is predicated on the notion of experimentation, critical dialogue, making gestures that work through problems or work against ideas, or work toward the expression of new ideas. It is not so much about the specific political content of an artwork, but rather is about the act of communicating meaning, which is always a way of moving forward. If we understand that all art is political, we can see that each gesture, whether abstract or representational, opaque or obvious, complex or even confounding, through its very existence offers a position which is, in fact, a political gesture. MOCA, Cleveland Museum of Contemporary Art, as the home for art, is by extension a home for critical and open dialogue, a place where different positions and perspectives can be communicated and discussed with the idea that there's no wrong position, there's only a way forward. So I know many of you know I recently moved to Cleveland from New York. I'm really at the very beginning of understanding what it means to live in a swing state, in a place where political engagement takes on a whole new form. But many of you may not know that I'm not able to vote here. I appear culturally American, but as a Canadian citizen, I am a resident alien. I have a green card, I pay taxes, I've lived here for nearly 10 years, but I still can't vote until I become an American citizen, which will take another five years. Um, I'm extremely lucky to be a neighbor coming from the north and not the south, and I've benefited very much from the privilege that position has offered me. <coughs> but there are many other voters, uh, many others in the country who can't vote. 5.8 million people will not be eligible to vote this year because they've been convicted of a felony despite serving their sentence. And like me, there are 22 million non-citizen residents who will not be able to vote because of their immigration status. So as a curator, with my own artistic practice of sorts, I see my own work as being political in its efforts to communicate meaning, like, like many of the artists we show here at MOCA. Whether I'm organizing a show on minimalism or a town hall conversation, I see political engagement taking different forms, many that go beyond the ballot box, and this is our hope for our conversation today. One of the things I've observed since moving to Cleveland is that there are great challenges, and there is also an incredible resurgence. The devoted grassroots work taking place throughout the city demonstrates a very important movement, 
and its energy is very inspiring. And when thinking about this program, we recognize the urgency in continuing the dialogue. And we saw an echo in the efforts the Four Freedoms Collective has embarked upon across the country these past few months. Hank can speak more to what Four Freedoms has been doing in many of the cities across the country, particularly in swing states like ours. Uh, and the ways that the, pro the platform has allowed artists to contribute and engage with the political system. But first, I'd like to focus us back to a specific framework for our conversation today. Four Freedoms is a wordplay on the four essential freedoms that Fred President Roosevelt spoke of in his 1941 State of the Union Address. The freedom of speech and expression, the freedom to worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. We would like to use the idea of these four freedoms as a guide or a stepping off point for our conversation today. We feel these four freedoms speak so clearly to the issues that impact our social and political environment today in ways that are both similar and also very different from when Roosevelt articulated them almost 70 years ago today. Each of our guests draw on extensive experience in very diverse fields and have worked to uphold these freedoms in everything that they do. So right now I'll ask my colleague Deidre to introduce each of our panelists and um, following that I think we're going to play some musical chairs to get everyone um, in the spirit of collaborative dialogue and mix things up a little bit per Hank's normal way of working. So here to Thank you, Andrea. So like Angela and Andrea mentioned, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce our panelists and then we're going to uh, do some shuffling to get us in a more um, cohesive space. Uh, I will start by introducing Hank Willis Thomas, who's in the back of the room there. Um, <laughs> photo conceptual artist Hank Willis Thomas is the co-founder of Four Freedoms as well as several other collaborative projects that have visited Cleveland, including the Truth, Brute, the Truth Booth and Question Bridge. Jane Sachs, <laughs> who's taking a picture of the audience on my left, <laughs> is a creative collaborator, arts producer, writer and educator, and uh, founding artistic director of Project AND. Uh, she creates new models of cultural participation and experience with social impact. Amanda King, to my right. Uh, Amanda is a change agent in the Cleveland police reform process. Uh, she is the founder of a nonprofit called Shooting Without Bullets. And uh, Reverend Dr. Bennett Guess, also to my right. Vice President, Council for Health and Human Service Ministries. Uh, he's also a member of Moga Cleveland's Board of Directors. And our moderator, Dan Malthrop, to my left. Uh, Dan, who many of you know, he is CEO of the City Club of Greater Cleveland. Uh, now I'm going to pass things over. Oh, I have one more, one more thing. Um, I wanted to mention that we, we encourage everyone to share your thoughts, to voice your opinions, to ask questions and join the conversation. And we ask that you raise your hand and wave the microphone. Uh, and we're, we'll be recording this for our website. And if you, you're welcome to take as many photos as you would like and, and post on social media at Mocha Cleveland and hashtag Four Freedoms. Uh, now I'm going to pass things over to Hank, if you have some directives for us. Oh, sure. Um, I am excited to be here because this is one of the, I think, best states and best cities, particularly because of the incredible diversity of ideas and people that live in the state. And the fact that there are so many incredible conversations that happen here that just don't happen anywhere else is really amazing. Um, I, I, just as Deidre was, was talking, I thought to look up uh, Grace Lee Boggs, who is an activist, a Midwest activist, and she, she recently passed away. And she said, you cannot change a society unless you take responsibility for it, unless you see yourself as belonging to it and responsible for changing it. I think uh, it's incredibly important that we take positions, but also are willing to acknowledge that our position has to, to change in order for us to move forward and for us to evolve. So uh, in the spirit of that. <laughs> in the spirit of changing positions. Would you like to? Uh, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a suggestion. Morris Wheeler, would you stand up, please? Yes, you're Morris Wheeler. Okay, everybody on this side of Morris Wheeler, you're gonna take your chairs and bring them over this way and turn them around and face them that way. Okay? This, this is seriously, we are changing our positions. And then we wanna ask everyone else to to help kind of scoot up circle. a little bit. We're gonna make a big circle here. Because we realize that the people in the back often don't have feel as inspired to the Bring it. Bring it all the way back. So if you guys in the back you can move into the circle with this. Students, the poor, the forgotten, 
um, people who are, 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 are incarcerated. These are the people that need to be talked about. I know that we're trying to you know, expand the economy and, and bring work into America, but there are a lot of people right here, right now, who are struggling, and I just hope that the presidential candidates understand the severity of that. Ben Gass, we're, uh, I, I can't help but feel listening to, listening to people and, uh, at this moment, but also over the last year, that we are all simultaneously holding some of our greatest hopes and our greatest fears in tension with one another. Well, certainly. So and I'll start with the hopes part of it. I'm, I'm really inspired and wanting to be inspired by our gathering this afternoon. And so thank you all for turning out. This, this is an amazing turnout uh, for this town hall. Um, like the others, I'm, I'm nervous and even deeply fearful in my worst moments. But the way I reassure myself is to remind myself in the inherent goodness of people. And I'm, I'm giving myself to that, to, to trust that a majority of people in this country will vote for fairness, kindness, tolerance, you know, will vote for love on Tuesday. And, and I, I really, uh, that's the way I calm my nerves. How many people have already voted? Thank you, thank you. It's not bad. Was that about a third of the room? I think something like that. That's fantastic. Um, Jane, how are you feeling? And in particular, how are you feeling about the engagement of arts and politics, or artists with politics? From my point of view, it feels almost more uh, more engaged than ever. Yeah, I think so, and I think that um, I, mean, I feel like this is one of the richest and most saying 
that he wanted to rid the world of tyranny, they, he was imprisoning Japanese Americans uh, and disenfranchising African Americans. And at the same time that they talked about freedom from want, they, there was uh, an incredible wealth disparity that was in, in happening then and now has gotten so much more. And we decided that rather than being FOUR freedoms, we wanted to be FOR freedoms because we wanted to be able to keep our minds open, to be open to representing freedoms that we don't necessarily personally agree with, but we have to acknowledge that we are going to be wrong about many of the things that we feel today. And I think for freedoms it is really an opportunity to engage and ask everyone to become a collaborator with us to come into the space to use their voice, to use their pen, to use their creative pro creative abilities to inspire other people to think differently about the world. So if you go and fill in the freedom of or the freedom from um, signs, please make sure you share and communicate them with other people. And let's ask, what's your freedom? If you've written one down already, you can share it. If you haven't, if you're just thinking about it, what is it's not necessarily, it could be freedom of speech, freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom of worship, but what's yours? Raise your hands. Let's hear from you. Hi, so um, my freedom that I wrote down was freedom from anger. Why? Because so, I think there's a lot of anger on all sides. I think people are maybe justifiably angry, maybe not justifiably angry, and then other people respond to that with their own anger, and I think there's a lot of anger. And I don't think that moving forward is possible with so much anger. And so we need to like get rid of the anger somehow, like diffuse it, and then we can have a conversation. And then other people like are justifiably angry and they're silenced because their message doesn't want to be heard if it can't be delivered in an appropriate way. So there's also that. So anger is really challenging. You just echoed something that Amanda was saying just before we got started. Do you have anything else to add about anger and its silencing capacity? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's okay to be angry. It's natural to be angry, but I think that it's what you do with those ang that anger that, that will change America. I think that art is the best way to um, put that angry energy into something that's positive. But anger is also what drives many movements. It's why people stand outside with their signs and who boycott. I mean, that is what anger comes from. And it's the lack of love in our communities that make us angry. So I appreciate you for expressing your anger. And you can see how many people around you feel the same way. And that creates love. So I dig it. You're free to man. I think it's similar to yours, but it's the freedom to evolve. And I think it's so important. No one is going to change if um, there isn't um, an avenue to make the change. You'll just stay with status quo. And sometimes you have to have that dialogue. You have to sh put the mirror up and show people. And you have to help them move along that road because all of us have moved along that road you know, no matter where we started as a child to, to where we are today. Who else? Freedom to demand excellence. I think a lot of times we get mixed up with just trying to move forward, but we have to understand what, what the true meaning of what it is that we want whether it's in art, whether it's in training, whether it's in politics. I think that some of that is hand in hand in accountability because we need to understand when we need to evolve, when we need to demand more in, of ourselves, but also the people that are leading us. So we can't stop short of, well, this is the best we can get now, but we have to always look further, look up, and look for the best because we all and we have to understand that we all deserve the best. While you speak, do you want me to videotape you speaking? Okay. This is, this is all inclusive. Go ahead. Um, off of what the last two people said, um, I've been telling my class that we need the freedoms to evolve, that we need to evolve. If you look at our, our black communities, 
things. They're, they're angry and they don't really understand what their anger is. It's coming from the generations before. They don't understand what's going on before. They're just angry and they speak to each other in the worst way. We need to have that freedom to not just grow, not just to demand excellence, but to treat each other with common decency. It's so needed worldwide. And, and this election just it speaks to it. The common decency that I would like to see, is anybody else playing <laughs> right with me? It ain't there. It ain't there. So what does that say about our country? You know, what does it say about us? As, as a people, and I want to have the freedom to love, learn, and grow, and evolve, and demand excellence, not just for myself, but from my fellow man, from my neighbor, from my daughter, from my husband, demand more in my house. Hey, can you please? Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> can I get my car washed? We're Jesus Christ, please. We're, we're on live, right? We're on Facebook Live right now. This is exciting. Go ahead, you're next. Uh, yeah, I would like freedom from the master's tools. I would like to pick up where you left off with, we are at a time where we have access to technology, skills, honesty. We can go to a place where in our thinking, um, both whites, blacks, Asians, browns, um, I have friends who went up to Standing Rock the last couple of weeks. I'm just thinking about these sorts of, uh, Gosh, I don't even know how to articulate it, but yeah, freedom from the master's tools. I am, I have a lot of access, a lot of privilege, and I am mad about that, that I have to use tools that don't even belong to me in order to articulate a message and work in a system that's not for me. So I get that. Why do I have to continue to participate? So that's what I want. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. I, 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 I wholeheartedly disagree with you. Uh, and I, I say that because you, it is here for you. And, and that's what I think the important thing that I learned from Gracie Fox, who was a Chinese-American, African-American activist. Although she was Chinese-American in the 30s and 40s, her mantle was to fight for African-Americans. I think this idea that there's an us and a them is the, the most dangerous thing of all. I'm not a type of person. I am a person, you know, and I think that the danger that we all, I think the worst part for me, every election season, they say the black vote, the female vote, the Latino vote, the white male vote. I'm like, does that mean like, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, am I wearing a uniform that forces me to actually have to do something because I'm part of a group? I don't think Barack Obama was elected because of the black group. Maybe he just was the best candidate. And maybe a lot of people just voted for the best candidate. And I think that the danger in kind of giving us feeling that we're part of, like I don't, if somebody, I love everybody, but I don't want to be responsible for every African American male. And no, I'm not saying that you are, but the reality is that what happens, the danger with Trayvon Martin, for instance, was he was not seen as a person walking through his neighborhood. He was seen as a type of person walking into a neighborhood where he doesn't belong. And, and I'm, I, 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 no, I'm not, I'm not, when I say I'm countering you, I'm not, Challenging you, I'm, count, I'm challenging the me. I understand. In that. No, I, I understand. I feel. Um, oh my bad. I uh, <laughs> I um I understand what you're saying. I, I I totally. I guess what I'm trying to sort of understand um, in my experience. Um, I'm a transplant from Salt Lake City. So. Um, See, I didn't know they had black people in Salt Lake City. And that, <laughs> that, that's, 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 that's what, what I'm talking about. about. It's that joke right there that I'm just. Like, that's the problem. That, that's the, that you illustrate the problem. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And so I guess that's the thing that I'm sort of negotiating still, being in a predominantly black community, which I did not have that experience before I came. I mean, I don't know what else to do with that, you know? And so, um, so you're right, I am a person, um, but I'm a Utah, and um, go Utes, right? We have you know, I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I can't, I don't, I'm not articulating. No, what you're saying is exactly, emotion. It, so I just, but I, you're I can't. Uh, what you're saying is, you say you're a Utahan. There's an agency, and I'm saying that we, we can claim many identities all at once. So I'm African American, I'm short, I'm ugly, I got gas, I am smart. <laughs> I, I'm not, but I, I'm just saying, yeah. I want us to be able to be seen in all of our complexities, not in 
the, the surface reading of our gender and our ethnicity. That's right. Go ahead, and then we got another one over here. Well, to nip it in the bud, um, my mother told me a long time ago that I was a child of the universe. So it is, you know, I want the freedom to be a child of the universe. I don't claim anything because somebody's going to claim me no matter what I do. Somebody's going to say I'm this, I'm that, and that claiming of something gives people permission to set up a hierarchy, and that hierarchy starts us and them, me putting you down, and things to that effect, and I don't want to do that. So in order for me to go somewhere else, in a peaceful place that coexists in harmony, and re representing you know anger, joy, love, pain, the yin and yang, I'm a child of the universe, and I claim that as my friend. Wonderful. Let me say too, uh, if you're not a uh, the kind of person who likes to rock the mic, but you do have a Twitter account, we're at, at hashtag Four Freedoms the whole time, and then and then we've got people who are keeping track of that, and we can work your comments in on your behalf through the miracle of Twitter, if you like. It's all up to you, sir. The freedom I'd like to interject is the freedom from intolerance. In this political season, it seems that the gulf between opposing points of view is wider than it ever has been before, at least in my memory, to the degree that when I look at the other side, the side that disagrees with me, um, I, I wonder where is reality or where has truth gone? Because there seems to be a disconnect between points of view sometimes and what I regard or what objectively could be regarded as truth. So much so that I'm reminded of a quote by Bill Maher on one of the shows where he asked an audience or studio guest, what color is the sky on your planet? I mean, it almost bears no resemblance to what I consider, in some cases, the truth. Freedom for the truth. Freedom. We, you have one back here. Excuse me just a second, folks. Thank you. You're wonderful people. Go ahead. I am, um, first of all, I'm influenced by so much of what I'm hearing, but when you initially asked the question, what came to mind was that I want freedom uh, to experience joy and magic because, and I know that I'm creating this myself, this press to be um, realistic all the time, to be practical, to tamp down excitement, to tamp down happiness. So I want freedom, I want that, I want that experience of joy and feeling magic. I'm with you, I've been wanting a dance party lately. But, um... <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. And we'll work our way over there. Um, if I could just add to what this gentleman here said about kind of divisiveness. Um, I have a family here visiting Cleveland. I'm from New Jersey. Um, so that kind of divisiveness for me reaches a familial level. Um, those family members that are visiting are coming to see something I'm doing here on campus. I'm a freshman at Case. And it gets to the point where nobody's willing to talk about their opposing points of view, but kind of just throw shade at each other. Um, you know, family dinners get kind of awkward because people aren't really listening to each other, but just listening at each other and what they say that they will disagree with. Um, and there's just a lot of hatred in between opposing points of view that I don't really understand. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Mr. Cobb. I want to, yes. I want to see freedom of movement. Uh, addressed around the world, both both because we keep calling people who have no choice, uh, who are who are refugees, we call them immigrants, as if as if they have some choice of where to go and they really have no home. But also because places like Cleveland haven't changed geographically in the last 30 or 40 years, and and as long as a child. Uh, in a white suburb is afraid of going to East Cleveland or doesn't have a connection to someone on the west side, our divisions are going to stay, stay the way they are. I uh, have a freedom in my mind and in my heart to connect with myself. And yes, there is always a voice going on in my head that I talk to. And to connect with other people. Uh, that I don't normally connect with. When I do that, I, it's an invitation to a possibility. Now, I don't know what that possibility is. In my mind, that possibility is not to demand anything, you know, demand you be this way, because we all have so many different perspectives, as, as we can see in, our, in this uh, uh, current uh, cycle, uh, political cycle. But I, I have that, that freedom. No one can keep me from uh, engaging myself in meaningful conversation. And, and striving to be whatever it is 
that true me is and then connecting with other people so I can glean from them and they can glean from me. Uh, over the last, uh, since November, I've been traveling between uh, Tennessee and Miami. I came back to Cleveland in June and the, the conversations were amazing. And my family's from Huntsville and you know, you want to go to good old boy town, you go, you, you go there, Scottsboro, where the Scottsboro boys happen is 30 minutes down the road. And the conversations are amazing when you engage someone in sincerity, when you open up the opportunity for them to speak their mind in freedom without fear of some kind of reprisal and uh, get them to a point where they're not thinking of the next thing, well, you said that, I'm gonna say this, just receiving what they have to say and letting that mow around and see what that does to you. It's, it's, it's interesting how often other people catch on really quickly and they start to do the other thing. Do that also. That reminds me of a conversation I was having just yesterday about freedom of speech and the importance of listening, which comes hand in hand with freedom of speech. Ben Guest, when we were preparing for this event, um, you talked about, the, about how important freedom of worship is to you professionally, but the personal meaning it has. Yeah. Um I think we've been fed this uh, idea that, that you know the U.S. colonies began uh, this great commitment to religious freedom, when actually, you know, cultures generations ago did it much better than we did as a fledgling nation. We certainly didn't respect the worship traditions of Native Americans. Uh, we certainly, in fact, many of our original colonies were founded because of religious persecution. Pennsylvania, Connecticut, um, uh, Rhode Island. Um, even Maryland was founded on the principle of freedom of worship so that Protestants and Catholics could live together. But the parameters of what that freedom meant were so narrow that people still had to believe in the Trinity, and if they didn't believe in the divinity of Christ, they were to be executed. And even Catholics were not allowed to hold office in the 1700s uh, because of the popacy problem that many of the Protestants saw as there. So freedom of religion has always, even up until, you know, um, after the Revolutionary War, when Virginia led us into this idea of freedom of worship, uh, the parameters grew a little bit. But we know through mandatory Bible reading, mandatory um, prayer in schools, all of that still uh, was so narrow in our understanding. So for me, um, freedom of worship, I would like to redefine that as freedom of imagination. And when I go to my faith community or any faith community, I feel myself being invited to stand on my head, uh, to see the world upside down to see a world where those who are last shall become first, those who are not in power have power, those who are mighty are brought down from their thrones, those who are rich are sent empty away, where spears are turned into uh, objects of usefulness. Um, I'm sorry to preach here, but... Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and, and I think if we could begin to see that freedom of worship as a freedom of imagination, then it begins to give our, ourselves the potential to, um, to focus on what we want to give ourselves to. Worship, I think the best of worship, is that which you give yourself to a greater good. You give yourself to a transformed individual, and you give yourself uh, to a transformed uh, society. And so what it is you devote yourself to, the freedom to, to venerate something, uh, is, is so much more powerful than limiting it to what happens on a Sunday morning or a Friday evening, um, but, but has a greater, a greater purpose. Whether it involves a deity or not, or a faith tradition or not, there is something that you can be devoted to and that is what the freedom of worship means to me. Yeah. I, I want a restoration of limitations on freedoms. That this election has brought out such extraordinary hate speech. That there's been this notion that you can, can have a right to a weapon without regard that you live in a country, in a society, in a community. And 
Our freedoms, these freedoms that we are entitled to under the Constitution, are not unlimited, and they've never been unlimited. And I want to return of rational, reasonable limitations that the anger that I feel is this disconnect between core values that we have in this nation and candidates, including ones I voted for, who, who get up and, and literally don't represent and say things that are so contrary to what we all know that we can't even have our children watch television. And so I want the laws back. I want political correctness back because that's what is consistent. It's not a fad. Political correctness is about politically aligning yourself and your speech to core values of our country. Thank you. Um, I've heard freedom, I've heard about, we've heard about speech, anger, freedom from anger, freedom of imagination, freedom to experience joy and magic, freedom from divisiveness, freedom to be transformed, to evolve, freedom from hate, freedom from violence. Um, let's get just a couple more in this moment. Oh, Mansfield, you got, you got the mic again? Mansfield, always, always with the microphone, Mansfield. <laughs> I apologize. If I know you, I'm going to mock you, and I apologize. Hi, I'm visiting in Vermont. Welcome to Cleveland. Thank you. It's my first trip to Great City. Um, I think that so many of the things that we're doing as human beings, both in this country and on the planet, are not working. And this election just sort of brought all of that to a head. Um, the stories we tell ourselves about who we are, what we believe and what we do kind of got blown up. And I, I guess if I want a freedom for us, and by us I mean all humans, um, is the, create, the ability to be creative and embrace something new. Um, I, I'm not sure I know exactly where our country is going, no matter what the outcome of the election is, um, without, and particularly young people. I really want to hear from young people. I mean, I come from a state where most people I kind of look like me, um, and there's a lot of agreement in our state about you know what the problems are and you know how we're working on them. Um, but we're a small, tiny state, and uh, you know we need we need to embrace all of you as well. So um, that's what I hope. I hope we can all be creative together and, and just admit we don't really know exactly where to go. That's why we're here. Thank you, um, Amanda. Uh, she just spoke to her interest in hearing about the freedom to create and, and young people, which sort of aligns quite neatly. It's almost as if we set you up to speak next. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, my name is Amanda King, and I am the founder and creative director of Shooting Without Bullets, which is Cleveland's revolutionary youth photo voice program. I want freedom from, from fear, and so do my young people, and I also value freedom of expression, which includes creativity, especially for those who have been pushed outside of society. And I'm going to take you down a little bit of a, a, a story, if you will, a history lesson. So in 1712, this guy, Willie Lynch, he was a slave driver. And um, Mr. Lynch, okay, they want me to be in the middle, all right. Um, Mr. Lynch um, instructed plantation owners that in order to prevent children born into slavery from resisting, that they were to keep their bodies, but take their minds. Keep their bodies, but take their minds. And to do so, Lynch advised them to create a multiplicity of illusions that would keep them steadfast in their captivity. And today, people in positions of power in America um, use illusions to maintain the status quo. It is an illusion that every man, woman, and child in this country has the freedom of speech, freedom from fear, freedom from want, and freedom to worship. But as powerful as illusions are in perpetuating inequality in our society, every now and then ordinary people wake from these illusions and they resist them. Mamie Till, the mother of Emmett Till, um, dispelled the illusion that America was a, was a just country when 
She left Emmett's casket open for the world to see the deadly effects of state-sanctioned segregation in the South. The Black Lives Matter movement is driving hundreds of thousands of us to take off our color blinders and to see the horrific effects of police brutality against blacks. In Cleveland, our police department engages in a pattern of practice of unconstitutional policing, which is why they're under a consent decree. Black youth are disproportionately affected by negative police encounters and are the shock absorbers of policing issues in this country. So me, as a leader, a youth advocate, an artist, a caring citizen, I created a program that would help our young people dispel the illusions of growing up in the inner city of Cleveland. I wanted our young people to use photography and creativity to tell truth about the places where they're living where racism, violence, and poverty coexist. But you can't just give a kid a camera. And you can't just give a kid, you know, say, go out and create. So what we at Shooting Without Bullets do is we develop a social justice curriculum which helps them to contextualize what they're seeing out there in the streets. And creativity is a profound tool for young people. But they also need to be engaged in the democratic process. They need to be engaged in changing the policies that are negatively affecting them. So when we have our Shooting Without Bullets exhibitions, we invite the community, which includes educators, law enforcement officers, um, uh, policy makers, and families, in the hopes that not only we can, we can bring up young people to be change agents, that we can provoke conversation that is really needed about their position in society, but also to ultimately um, impact and inform police reform in Cleveland and beyond. And I hope that as, if you take one message away from me today as a youth advocate, give young people the tools that they need to express themselves. Be it a camera, be it um, a sketchbook, be it um, tools for animation, or just be it the platform, the soapbox, to stand here in the middle of a room and say, this is how I'm feeling, and this is the change that I need. Thank you, Amanda. Um, <laughs> what Amanda's brought us to is this, is the, you know, one answer to the question, what does art have to say to you know, to, in response to the challenges that we face. I wanted to, to bring in Kate Sopko here, who did an extraordinary video, um, video project. It's hard to describe it as, as any one thing in particular, called The Fixers, which many, hands up if you've seen The Fixers, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, the rest of you need to do some Googling. Um, the Fixers was a project that was uh, designed to give voice to people who otherwise wouldn't have voice during this moment, uh, during this last summer, during the Republican National Convention when um, there was a, a lot of prevailing narratives about Cleveland, about politics, about other things, and, um, and Kate's project gave voice to, uh, to grasp people experiencing life as it is lived, the lived experience of poverty, the lived experience of blackness, the lived experience of being, um, uh, of being among the people who, uh, for whom life isn't great in Cleveland. And Kate, I just wanted to ask you if you would talk a little bit about what we all learned, what you learned through that process, and correct anything that I might have misdescribed about your project. Uh, thank you. Um, so, the first thing I'll correct <laughs> is that I think the, the Fixers was a huge collaborative undertaking, and a lot of people were a part of making it happen. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. But it wasn't about people who didn't have voice, it was about people who. <coughs> Um, it was about basically going off the idea that everyone has voice um, and that our political process really isn't giving much time or energy towards making sure that the people most impacted by policy and how resources flow in this country are able to tell their own stories and say, is this working, is it not working? Because we have plenty of people doing brilliant things on the ground who know exactly what they need, who just don't have space in this political process to make anything happen. 
And so when the RNC was coming to town, we spent about a year prior pulling together people who are um, doing work around social equity and uh, through many different threads in the city and asking them what tour of the city they would give RNC delegates if they had the chance. And so we produced six short films, each one following one of these what we call fixers um, on a tour. And these are up on a website right now called The Fixers Cleveland if you want to see them. Um, when I think about the freedoms we were talking about, I feel like it's um, a freedom of self-narration. And I feel like um, if our political process doesn't get really serious about um, asking people what they know of their lives and valuing that input, um, we are just going to continue seeing it go in this direction. And I'd say in the after effect of what turned into a very large community process, a freedom I would hope we would invest more in would be freedom to heal from trauma. I think part of what we're seeing in this country right now is it really coming to a head that like there has been such structural violence underneath who we are as a nation um, and we need to get much better tools at our disposal for everyone to move forward from that. Thank you, Kate. I think we have, uh, somebody's got the microphone right over there. It's your turn. No, just something to add? Oh, you're just holding on to the mic. Hank, is this, um, I think you were, you were, Mansfield? We stole it from you before. <laughs> One of the things that I kind of, I kind of noticed early on, but it's kind of changed. Anytime there's a group like this, the vast majority of the people that speak out are African American. And I've often wondered why is that? Do we have more to complain about? I don't know. Uh, is that a question for the group? Uh, that was just a question I threw out, something to consider. Uh, and, and I don't know if this is a, a question of freedom, but just like this group here, fairly intelligent, educated people, there's a group sitting somewhere else in America, in a circle like this, that are saying exactly the polar opposite of what we're saying. And they think they're as right as we are. And we need to keep that in mind. Those are the people who probably are going to vote for Donald Trump. Who, uh, Hank, when you said that no matter what the election, your tomorrow is going to be the same. And that's probably true for everybody in this room. If Trump wins, our life doesn't change. But like Amanda was saying, those young people, those people in poverty, those at the lower end of the economic spectrum that are not in this room, their lives are going to change dramatically if Trump wins. Hank, push I back. I my life wasn't going to change, I said my job wasn't going to change. Because the work that I do is about hopefully helping us to realize that they are us and us is them. And those people who, there is no winning in our country. If so and so wins, all that happens is that other people start to plot their demise. And so the more of us that see ourselves as a greater us, there's that thing, united we stand, divided we fall, then we divide and conquer based on gender, ethnicity, class, et cetera, uh, that we need to really embrace it, the multitude of us. And I don't care which one very wealthy, likely nice person wins. Um, I got the same job. And I, and I think, I'm not saying those people's lives, but I think the one thing that, I wouldn't normally say this, so hopefully no one's recording. But Everybody's true, recording, you're on Facebook Live. Uh, what I always said, like the one thing that could be great about a Trump presidency is that we get to watch Empire fall. Because we did always wonder how it ends. And this idea of like us absorbing our greed, I mean, we're not as great as we think we are, right? From a global historical perspective, the, we take up way more space for, per population, and both intellectually uh, and, and environmentally than we probably deserve. And I think the reality is, at what point do we start to let other people, because the job of the American president, we should not be dissuaded. This, that their job is to make sure that we're doing better than everybody else. There's a movie called The Head of State where Chris Rock made anybody remember. My favorite line is they say, God bless America and nowhere else. <laughs> uh, and so, the, the reality, so when we say, you know, God bless America, that's, that is what we mean. And I, I, you have to wonder at what point do we have to start, you know, what, you know England, France, Spain, they're not once, what they once were. And, and I think that's, the world became better because of it. So, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, so dis I'm so sad that, I mean, I don't know, I, I have to sort of through that. You've got something to say, James, go. 
Hey, Dan. Um, so my freedom, oh god, everybody's trying to hi. <laughs> Stand up. Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> so I guess my freedom would be the freedom from ignorance, which I have not, okay, I guess it. Uh, I have never been involved in or seen a problem that was hurt by someone knowing less about it at the end than they, when they started. So, you know, there's so many things that I learned recently. Um, in the last, I'm, a, I'm a transplant too, Manhattan to Cleveland. I was woefully ignorant of all things Cleveland before I came here. I was like, that is the stupidest place in the world. Why would I, why would I ever leave the jewel that is Manhattan for the mistake on the lake? And then I met, I met a girl from here, married the crap out of her, and followed her straight to Cleveland. And I've fallen in love since the third week I was here, because I came in like March. <laughs> and, you know, it's that experience and that learning that, that gave me an understanding of something that I had and I should have not had any opinion on whatsoever because I didn't know anything about it. But I don't remember an exact time, but I guarantee you I was like, Cleveland sucks. But I had no right or to say anything like that because I was ignorant of that situation. So that kind of thing goes, and that's, if you, the more you know, the better off everybody will be, I imagine, something to affect. Thank you very much. Freedom from ignorance. Um, in a second, Jane, can you, you had something you wanted to add before, I think. So you. I actually, um, one thing that you were saying, I worked in a um, prison in New Orleans when I was way too young to be doing that, teaching writing. Um, it was a lifer's prison, and I worked in a women's prison. And one day, um, one of the women that I'm still very close to said to me, I don't want your life, I don't want to go to parties and concerts and you know, jazz clubs. She said, I want to know what you know, and I want to know how you know. And I think we've kind of lost sight of what it means to actually know about things, you know? Um, but I think that that's, you know, that idea of how we learn things and through what experiences is also a big part of what art is, is that it creates these opportunities to learn about things in very different ways. Um, and that there are multiple dimensions to that knowledge and how you learn. Thank you. Yes, I, I just want to disagree with Mansfield. I think my life will change if Donald Trump wins. I think it's, I don't want to see a bully win because I think it, it frees up other bullies and I don't want his impact on the Supreme Court, which I think could affect all our lives and our children. Thank you very much. Go ahead, sir, and back. Uh, my, my question is how did this, the how to help others to be free from fear. Uh, something happened to me about two hours ago. I had taken my grandson to a private job at the garden center. And I had to figure out what to do. Do I sit in my car or do I walk? So I decided to walk around Wayne Oval. It was a beautiful day. Children were playing on the sculptures. Uh, there were brown leaves and orange leaves and red leaves. And I was just taken, I was awestruck. So as I'm walking around the oval, I see a, a, a young lady whose wife, about 50, between 50 and 60 years old, who was sitting alone on the bench and was enjoying the same moment that I was enjoying. So I was so struck, I said to her, I didn't offer to sit on the seat beside her. I said, isn't this a beautiful day? And to think, all of this is free. She was like a stone wall. And so I said, well, maybe she didn't hear me. <laughs> so I said it again. And the second time, I got the same response. And my initial thought was, she's prejudicial. But she is really imprisoned by fear. How do we help move people from fear to we had more in common at that particular moment? We both were enjoying the beautiful day. How do you help an individual like that? With hugs? I don't know. I just wanted to respond to something uh, Mr. Fraser uh, just said. He brought up uh, the fact that there typically are more African Americans speaking in forums like this. And I recall when the City Club sponsored Ta-Nehisi Coates down at Cleveland State, and he was asked the question, what do we do about this? And he t re responded, that's not the question you ask me. We are the ones who are, who are victimized by structural racism and systematic uh, oppression. 
So the question is, why and how can people who are not so impacted speak among themselves to resolve the issues that they benefit from, to resolve what's happening structurally? And it kind of goes back to the victim. I, I, again, I believe that they, uh, they do suffer. I don't think that oppression doesn't affect, negatively affect the oppressor. I think we've learned very much through United States history and culture that the oppressed actually have been the people who have led the culture forward, almost every example. You know, the people who want to keep things the same are the people who actually always wind up losing. You are so hard to track, Hank. You're like a, I know. I'm lost too. It's like Scooby. It's like it's like as if we're having the town hall on a Scooby Doo episode. Exactly. No, the, the, I mean, I, I I I really feel like we have to. The reason that I I, I used to hate art. I did. I, I'm I'm a photographer. I hated abstract art, conceptual art, because I didn't get it. And at some point, someone was like, "Yeah, that's okay for you not to get it," because that means that you're going to have to keep thinking and look deeper. And I think what we lack in our society is to actually, we, we want things to stay the same. I'm not a victim. I am a descendant of slaves. I grew up in uh, going to Crack Block, North Philadelphia, but I also have had parents who, by luck and sometimes stupidity, did not believe that they belonged in whatever position they were in. And, and, and grandparents who thought that it doesn't matter how anyone else treats me, my heart is of gold. And I think the, rea the reality is that we have to recognize that those people who might have all the money in the world, all the quote unquote power, are suffering much deeper than, than people who actually, they think they're oppressing. Because, and I, and I, and I don't, and I, I really want us to, to fight against this idea that some people have and some people don't. Because if we all have a TV and a car and all that other stuff that we actually don't need, we actually are moving away from life. We're not doing what this gentleman said, sitting in a park, interacting with a person, because we feel like we need to have something else. And that's, again, to me, part of my freedom, my freedom of, expectate, of living under anybody else's expectations, my freedom, so. So typically in these kind of events, I don't, I, I, I don't actually contribute. I just ask a lot of questions and, and play traffic cop. But I did want to respond because what you just raised, and I thank you for raising it, um, I asked that question of ta Coates. Not a day goes by that I don't think about that moment, one of the most uncomfortable moments of my life. Um, because I said to him, I said, like, look, like, I'm in, right? Let's, let's do this. Let's dismantle structural racism. How do we start? And he, he looked at me like he wanted to hit me. Like, you know, like you don't, he said, you don't, you, if you got your foot on somebody's neck, you don't ask, how can I get my foot off your neck? Right? So that's hard, right? And so Mansfield, you've asked, you and I have been, I, I've heard you ask that question before, by the way. One trick pony. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but um, I believe that this issue, this whole set of issues, this knot of issues that we're talking about, is probably the most important thing we can be talking about. And, um, and I believe that it's gonna take all of us to unravel this knot and take it apart. And it's not gonna happen in one generation. But I also believe that each of us has a contribution to make. And we have to figure out what our contribution is and then bring it to the table. And so, you know, for, for a, a goofball like me that doesn't mind, mind standing in front of people, I just sort of do this kind of thing. And, you know, Guide to Culture and City Club teamed up to do a book about it. That's what, that's what we're doing. But I think everybody has something to give. And this doesn't get solved. I don't think we can say this enough. This doesn't get solved until white people start to give a shit. It really doesn't. Who's next? I think Marche was next and then go okay. over here. Hello, Marche Greer, social media associate for the United Church of Christ, but just here because my good friend Deidre invited me. I wanted to respond to Mr. Thomas's comments, um, almost blaming oppressed groups for their own victimhood. I think that if I had to express a freedom that I would like, it would be the freedom to be intersectional. I am a queer black woman, so when I walk into a space, I would love to say that I'm responsible for whether I can adopt a child with my partner. I would love to say I'm responsible 
for if someone follows me around a store. I'm responsible for the numerous times that I've been pulled over by police officers, one time because I was wearing a backwards hat in a neighborhood where I don't normally walk, one time because um, a gentleman at a club said that my sister's hair was different and that she was going to be arrested if she didn't sign to prove that she was who she was saying she was, and then a bouncer confisc illegally confiscated her ID and then took her ID to the police officers in Kent, Ohio. Uh, another time I was pulled over with my dog in a, in a Honda Fit, and it, because uh, these cops were looking for active shooters, they were looking for two people and a Taurus, and I was in a hatchback with a 10 pound white dog. So while I would love to take responsibility just by being for those things happening to me, I refuse to give power to oppressors by claiming responsibility for my own oppression. I want the opportunity to not assimilate but still be, to have legal rights, to be, to be able to even have access to art, to writing as a journalist to not have to jump through hoops to write a mediocre column like David Brooks. I want the right to just be, even in a space hearing a black man blaming black people, a black man with access, blaming black people for their own oppression, to me is oppressive. As a, as a queer black woman watching the Black Lives Matter movement take off because three black women refuse to sit and watch and be told that the heteronormative Christian movement had to move the next generation of millennial black leaders forward to hear you say that we are responsible for our own oppression is offensive to me. Did anyone hear me say that? I, I actually, I, I mean, you know, I'm pretty sure that as an African American man who grew up in New York and North Philadelphia that I am, father who grew up in segregated south, uh, or I, who has likely been stopped by the police, and I'm pretty sure he probably thought he'd get killed every time, including, I don't know, last week, or who just last week got told there wasn't a seat at a table in a restaurant in New York City, in their neighborhood, when the two, three other people came right behind him and were given a table. So, Adam, I, I, was, I mean, it saddens me that you would think that I, I mean, I, I would think that black people are responsible for that. No, I, I disagree with what you said, Dan, that what James Baldwin would say was, is that as soon as you stop being white, because what he said, one of the brilliant things, he's, most brilliant things he said is, as long as you think you're white, there's no hope for you. Because as long as you think you're white, I'm gonna be forced to think I'm black. And for me, the craziest thing about blackness is that black people didn't create it. Blackness was created by Europeans with a commercial interest in creating a subhuman brand person. There are no black people. There are brown people. My skin is brown. My mother's skin is lighter. My father's skin is darker. They are people. And I think that as, as, at the moment that you, someone says that you don't have the right to be a person, that you don't have a right to be offended by what I say, that you don't have the right to shut me down, the moment that I, 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 I shrink as a person. So I, I'm sorry that I offended you and that I might have misled you, and I'm sorry that I, I gave people an impression that I said my job, I said my job will not change. I, didn't, I said my life, I did not say that. My life, well, it's gonna change either way, but my job is to hopefully ask people like you to replace David Brooks, uh, but not because of, he doesn't deserve his shot, because you think you can do a better job, and, and I think, Every time that we think, we, what we do unfortunately in our country is we let people we think are mediocre lead us. And I'm saying, at some point, like Alicia, um, like Patrice, like Opal, who I took her photograph, if you Google her, um, and she's one of the most beautiful, brilliant people I've ever met, um, they said, we're three, three women, queer women, African American women, but they literally changed the discourse in our country. And so that is not the position of someone who feels that they are disempowered. And they can take that power and we can take that power. And, I, and so I'm sorry that you think I'm blaming us. I'm just saying that as long as I walk into a room and I'm afraid, my father said, I'm sorry to go on. 
He said, when I was, I grew up in South Carolina, they couldn't, a black man couldn't look a white person in the face. And I was like, well, did you? He's like, well, of course I did. He's like, well, did your mother? Well, of course, of course she did. She was a 16-year-old single mother, African, dark-skinned African-American woman. And I was like, well, why not? He said, well, she, well, we were different. No, they were not different. They just refused to accept the reality of, that everyone else thought they were living in. And, and I think the moment that I allow somebody to press me, the moment that someone says nigger and I get offended, I lose my power. And I'm not gonna let anybody take my power because my power is my love. My love for people who I maybe fear, like who you can imagine might like, think about for election. But I gotta love that person because if I don't, I have no chance of winning them over. Go, go ahead. Okay, I have a question. Out of, out of all of these- Because I have no idea what to say right now. <laughs> <laughs> shifting gears. So out of all the provocations that have come out of this election cycle, um, one, of the, one of the ones that gets under my skin the most, and that I'd like to invite the panelists to weigh in on and comment on and unpack, is the phrase, make America great again. Um, I know that some of the four freedoms <laughs> materials have cited that, um, uh, juxtaposed with some imagery. And I'd like to just hear what, what that phrase means to different people on the panel. Do we have to? <laughs> <laughs> Not you, Hank. You'll be last, and you'll be limited to 30 seconds. Um, I think, um, Jane, go ahead. I think what I'm really struck by is um, this idea of a social contract. And, um, and social contracts are deep, They're deeper than laws. They really, I mean, a simple thing to say is like that we believe that, um, you know, we will stop at red lights the best we can, and you believe that I don't want to hurt you, and you don't want to hurt me, and so we're going to stop and try to drive a little slower, and, you know, we'll try our best, right? And we have built this kind of trust, and I think what's happened during this election season is that some of the social contracts that as a country we thought were in place, but a lot of us knew have never been in place are really being revealed that they are not in place. And some of the ones that were kind of always there, the idea that we could have somebody running for an office that he is not, like if I were interviewing him, you know, um, he wouldn't fit the, the position, he wouldn't have the skills. The idea that he could insult and really in such hatred talk about most everyone in this country, except a very small population. Like, to me, there's a social contract about who we are and who we want to be, right? And that, that we're supposed to be evolving and we're supposed to be participating. And so, if we're gonna make America great again, I'm not exactly sure when, when that was, um, then that's, that has to be us, right? And I think uh, something I've been thinking about in listening to everyone and uh, a lot about the way I think about mine and any way I think about my work is in terms of an ecology. Um, and an ecology is not about a hierarchy and it's not about things being equal. It's about things being equitable. And so right now, if you ask me between oxygen and water, I need oxygen because I'm talking to you. But you can't make me choose between water and oxygen because I'm going to need that later. And if we actually thought about creating systems like that in terms of our identity, I, I go through the same thing, right? You, you go to certain places and you're this or that. Well, what if it was an ecology where there was equity between all the elements of the way we located ourselves in the world? And what if we thought about America being great in terms of an ecology? Um, I do want to say one thing about Roosevelt's Four Freedoms is that, you know, one of the things is that he didn't succeed, you know? Um, we're not a country that's true from one. No, we're not a country where everyone can say what they think. No, we're, we're not a freedom, of, we're not a country of free of religion in very, in very particular ways. And what? We, I get, I get um, upset every time I hear our country referred to as a democracy. It's a republic. We do not vote directly for our quote unquote leaders. Um, the Electoral College does that for us, and we don't vote for those people either. And we unfortunately have only two parties. We should have more. 
because most of us in here probably realize that both of these parties are tainted greatly. So um, it's a, a very sad situation. Um, sure. I think it's important what you're talking about in terms of system, but I would just like to offer that a democracy doesn't just exist every four years. And a democracy is us, right? Yes. It's us on the ground every fucking day. It really is. And so if we wake up every four years, you know what? We might as well just go back to sleep, right? you know? And so I agree what you're saying about the life of college. I mean, uh, I try to totally understand it. But, um, but the thing is, what are we doing in between? You know, it's the collective tissue in life. It's the place between the monuments that really matters, right? And it's the time in between these big cycles that we need to be on the ground. Voting's great, but it's the, just like the floor of civic engagement. It is not the, the ceiling. Amanda, did you want to have a, a thought about um, Peter's question regarding making America great again? I think that we can um, make America great I think we should just say, make America great, right? Like, again, I don't know when it was great. Um, and I've studied a lot of history and a lot of law. I, I really don't ever know a time when it was great, where everybody had what our founding fathers um, said that we'd have, right? But I think that what is great about this time in America is this awakening and this resisting. And when change comes, when we the people uh, resist, like the civil rights movement to me was the most profound movement in American <laughs> history. And that was because people said that we were promised one thing and we got another and we are going to fight for our freedom and for our constitutional rights because we don't have them. So America, regardless of who wins this election, if we the people, we the people try to make America great by, yes, engaging in um, the political process, building our communities, um, educating our young people in forms that are outside of the traditional um, academic setting. If we um, make art a part of STEM, if we honor people's rights and uh, push our police departments for procedural justice, which is fairness and understanding and legitimacy and everything that we can do, America will be great. But it takes time and it takes the people to say that Hillary Clinton nor Donald Trump are going to change my life. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change my community. I am the greatest change agent that I can be. And we can push that. We, the, the power of the people is that we can push our leaders to listen to us. But it's constant. It's not we, just about that. I, I can see there's a lot of people leaning in. There's also a lot of, uh, we're, we're getting close to that 90 minute mark, which is typically when crowds can um, fall asleep, um, to be honest. But, um, so we're gonna do like three or four more people and then we're gonna kind of wrap it up, I think. And we had some, somebody back here who, two people back here, and we're gonna bounce over here. And everybody's got so much to say. Go ahead. So, hi, I'm Lauren Welch. I wanted to bring the conversation kind of full circle to this intersectionality because my care, my freedom was going to be to be carefree. But I think Marche um, articulated that so well in being able to be intersectional. And I also heard magic, magical as well. Um, to bring up this other thing about having um, majority people of color speak up on these issues um, and having to face this reality that somehow we can go and push ourselves forward and when I walk into rooms I have the full authority and power to be whoever I want to be uh, I think is a little misguided as well because as many spaces that I occupy I would also like to um, assume why so many not people of color feel comfortable being in rooms where there aren't isn't more intersectionality. Right, and so when I walk into spaces, you know, particularly when we talk about nation and we talk about America and we talk about the issues that exist in America, I would challenge people to think about the issues that exist right here in your hometown. How many people are you around that are intersectional, that are LGBT, that are of color? How many workspaces are you around that are LGBT, that are of people of color? 
And until we wake up and realize, okay, I'm sitting in a room where I'm not around a lot of people that look like me, I don't think that we're able to really uh, speak up on those issues because I see so many people in the room who, you know, want to speak up about these things, but then we get into these rooms or we get into these conversations and we're silent. And I think that has to come a lot from non-people of color for a number of different reasons. One, because there's obviously studies that show that when we speak up about our issues, we are often not only silenced, but it's bias, right? People think we're biased and we're angry because we're speaking up these issues. So when we do have non-people of color sit in those rooms and have access to those rooms, then they're able to say, hey, how about we get more people of color on staff? Hey, how come there's not representation in this room? And that does not happen as often as you, as progressive as Cleveland is, that is not often happening. I mean, we have to have these conversations on Twitter all the time about why is this panel all white and male? And then you have people who are like, we didn't even think about this, right? So when you're sitting here and we're talking about America, I would really like to challenge people to think about what is actually happening in your friendship circles, what's happening in your workspaces, and why are you the only, why, why are there no people of color in your spaces? Well, why is there only one? There's a gentleman behind you. So I just wanted to address what the lady said on the other side. <clears throat> so very beautifully said, and I... Put the microphone a little closer. Very beautifully said, and I agree with her, and to the gentleman that uh, spoke over there, I agree with you as well. And I wanted to address both what you said and to agree with what you said, that I don't think any one, or, sorry, we should go back and speak about America being great again. I don't think electing any one person into office is going to make America great again. I think it's the people that are sitting here today that working together are going to make America great again. So whether you're a registered Democrat, registered Independent, or Republican, you can't expect one person to make America great again. And similarly, so I come from an immigrant family, and I myself an immigrant. So the slogan, make America great again, is funny to me, because America is great. Okay, we're not perfect, but we are great. Okay, when you, a great I think is a very relative term, so when you look at what's going on in the rest of the world, the fact that we could have a Black Lives Matter movement, the fact that we could have protesters go out to the street and protest, that makes America great because we could voice our opinion. You try doing that in a, co in a country in the Middle East, you try doing that in a country in Kazakhstan, where I come from, no such thing, that's never gonna happen. So, America is great we should start moving to make an America perfect. And whether we'll ever reach that or not, probably not, but I'd like to get there as close as possible. It's the more perfect union. Welcome to Cleveland. Um, we had a couple over here, I think. Sir, go ahead. Hi, I'm William King. I'm Amanda King's father. I, I wanted to address the question about America being great again. First of all, what is the standard by which we measure ourselves as great? Uh, and, and who establishes what is greatness? If greatness is established from, from the top down to the bottom, then we will never know what that means. I think the standard, if we're going to be great, we have to look from, from the least from the bottom down and, and, and look at the conditions of the people at the bottom. And if you can establish some greatness down there, if, if that's what we really need to be, it would seem to me America should be a nation that is a, a nation of good, that we try to be good in everything that we do. We try to be good for, for young people, for older people, for all people of color, no matter what they are, but just think about great. I don't even know what that means. What, what's great? What's great to each one of you? Whose standard are, are we going to use? I mean, are we going to use Donald Trump's standard and I'm going to make you great again? Is that going to be economics? Is that going to be more money? Is that going to be in relation to the, to the rest of the world? But America should be a place where we're, we try to be good across the, the globe. We, we try to reach out and bless people who are in need. And the other thing is I have a problem with, I don't like people trying to tell me what's wrong with me. You know, I hear Donald Trump and, and others talk about what's wrong with the hood, and we'll use that word, and, and what's wrong with the schools, what's wrong with everybody in, in the school, what's wrong with the young people. It's hard for you to tell me what's wrong with me if you've never walked in my shoes, and you don't understand where I've come from. It would be the same if I try to tell you what's wrong with you, and I, and I haven't tried to get to know you 
or get to know the circumstances of which you're living in. When you get to know me, you might be better able to help tell me what's wrong with it. And that's been going on, I'm 64. When you know you first went to school and the teacher would tell you what's wrong with you and why you're not as equal as a white student and why you never will be and why you shouldn't try to be a doctor or why you shouldn't be a lawyer. Believe it or not, that happened in school when we were coming along. Why, I had a teacher ask me, why are you black kids able to run faster and jump higher than white students? That, that was profound to me instead of the question about why are you able to do math and do science just like everybody else can? That was a greater question to me rather than why we're so athletic. And this thing about, and I'll, I'll give it up, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President Roosevelt. All this thing of, of the freedom was a good thing, but I remember Jesse Owens when he went to Nazi Germany and he won all those gold medals. And he expected uh, Hitler not to shake his hand. But he also knew that when he came back to the United States of America, that President Roosevelt was not going to invite him to the right to the White House and give him his due respect for honoring America in the way that he did. And you know, he never did. And it was not until President Ford acknowledged the greatness of Jesse Owens. So you're right, greatness. Greatness comes under under what standard and what laws? What constitutes greatness? Mr. King, thank you very much. Y'all got it. Um, Hank, I wonder if, as we're wrapping up here, if you would be willing to um, just help us, help connect this conversation we've been having with the national conversation that you've been involved in, and also with the mission of this institution we're standing in the middle of, this mission of celebrating and exercising freedom of expression every day. Well, uh, there's a, I just got married, and uh, the fundamental, everyone got married, I, I was there at my wedding, was given a pin that said, love over rules. And I say love over rules, not love over rules, but love over rules. Because the rules that our society has taught us to live by are, are highly problematic. And the only way that we can accomplish the collective agenda, which is, I think, um, well, I think we can all agree that we want to have a, a safe society for everyone, that we want to actually be able to ha have, be, have those four freedoms, is if we can actually let go of the rules and say, because you're this way or because you think this way, I have to be against you. Uh, and I, that's a challenge for me because I am highly opinionated. And, as I mentioned, my opinions change all the time. <laughs> um, but the agenda for freedoms, as we just we, were, we just did a town hall at the Met in, in New York, we did one in LA yes, the, the day before that. We, we were in Mississippi and in Florida. I just came from North Carolina. We, all we want to do is spark these conversations. And it doesn't matter if we're right or wrong, um, if, if we're good or bad. But the thousands of people who have actually come out and just participated in this conversation and maybe heard something they didn't like and said, you know what, I'm going to go out and say something different. That's what Four Freedoms is about. We want people to actually go out into the world and not just listen, because if we watch CNN and Fox News and whatever else and, and listen to the, the poison that's in their heads, rather than giving them the things that we want to hear, we're actually always going to lose. So essentially, it's a provocation and, and hopefully a platform for um, mixing things up. We are going to wrap in a second. You're all invited to um, have a drink with us across the plaza at the ABC Tavern. Um, and, uh, and or if you decide you want to get into a deeper conversation with somebody else that you just met, take them out to dinner, whatever. Go to another bar. You don't have to talk to us, it's okay. Um, but I want you to do something first before we, before we give ourselves, give everybody near you a round of applause. I want you to turn to somebody next to you because I'm feeling this deep sense of gratitude right now and I think we all are actually, even though this has been a bit of a tough conversation at times. I appreciate all of you. And I want you to, I, I, if you would, if you're willing, please find someone to whom you can express your appreciation. I appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs>